Philippians chapter number one tonight, please. Philippians chapter one. And verse number 21, the apostle says, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Father, I pray now that you bless your word as it goes forth from the mouth of this messenger. I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, that it fall on good ground. We know the word's good. We know the seed is perfect. May it find good ground. In thy name we pray, amen. You can be seated. Have you noticed in the first chapter of Philippians all of the times that the Lord Jesus Christ is mentioned over and over and over? Look at it. If you've got a Bible in your hands, look at all that. Christ, Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ over and over, verse after verse after verse after verse. Notice he's saturated all over the first chapter of the book of uh, Philippians. Of course, all the way through the book itself, but we're dealing with the first chapter tonight. And the apostle says in verse 21, for me to live is the Baptist church. For me to live is the ministry. No. For me to live is the doctrine. No. My personal achievements. No. What did he say? For me to live is who? Christ. That's what a Christian is about, folks. A Christian is about a person. This is why they were called Christians at Antioch, because they were Christ-like. And how could they be Christ-like except the folks who called them that had known the Lord Jesus Christ? And they compared them to them. Absolutely. And uh, one of the old uh, writers, it was Tacitus or Pliny or one of them, one of the old ancient uh, Roman writers, historians, there's a, there's a number of them, Herodotus or, Herodotus or Herodotus, I forget how you pronounce his name, they call him the father of history. Then you've got Pliny, Tacitus, and, uh, and uh, a number of others that are writers and, and historians of that age. And they said this about the Christians. They said that once you begin to interrogate a Christian, once you... Once you, you, you put their life on the line, they said that very seldom will one ever, ever denounce or renounce their faith in Christ. They will die for their faith in the Son of God. They will die. And said, that's how you can tell they're true Christians. That's what the Romans said. That's how you can tell they're true. You see, what did Paul say? For to me to live is Christ, and to what? Die is gain. So he, therefore he compared death with Christ, and he said death is gain when we compare it to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the preaching today is all about this life and it's all about here and the now. And that's the sad thing because it's not about the here and the now and it's not about a pie in the sky and a sweet by and by either. It's about eternity, folks. It's about eternity. And this life, God will bless you and if you know the Lord, it'll be the best life you ever lived. The worst day in salvation is better than the best day not being saved. Yes, sir. The worst day I ever had as a Christian far outweighs the best day I ever had as an unsaved man. Yes, it is. Like our brother said a moment ago, God's been good to me. He's been good to me. He's been good to me. He used to sing a song, count your many blessings, name them one by one. And there's a lot of truth in that. If you ever have a hard time going to sleep at night, just begin to name off all the blessings God's given you. My pastor used to, Bill Cardwell used to be my pastor, and he said, if you want to go to sleep at night, just start praising God. He said, the devil will put you to sleep in heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of wisdom in that. Amen. A lot of folks lay awake at night trying to figure out how they're going to keep their money and hide their assets and all of that. But if you know the Lord, your treasures are laid up in heaven, not here on this earth. <laughs> Hallelujah. So uh, Paul said for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. He said, I have a he said, I have a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far greater. And he said, this light affliction, which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. He compared the eternity, the eternal life, and eternity to this little temporal abode here, and there's no comparison. And you know that as well as I do. You know how uncertain life can be. Once you've lived long enough, you don't have to be told. Once you've seen your friends and, and you've seen young children and young people pass from the scene, you begin to realize that it's a matter of daily survival in this world but it, if you're born again that cannot be taken away from you there was a time in this country when the christian uh message the gospel of christ 
had reached the hearts of so many people that there was a general feeling of, uh, of Christianity. Not that I don't suppose, I certainly don't, I certainly don't believe that everybody was saved, not at all. But I do believe that there was a time in this nation where the gospel was respected, the church house was respected, and the faith of Christ was not ridiculed in public like you hear it ridiculed now. What you're watching now is an onslaught of paganism. Neo-pagans, they call them. Neo means new. The new paganism. And paganism in every stripe, regardless of where it comes from or the, or the culture associated with it, you're seeing it. And you're seeing it in an in a unprecedented manner. For example, just a few days from now in the deserts of Nevada, they'll erect a huge man. And they'll call him the Burning Man. It'll be the Burning Man Festival. The Burning Man Festival is one of many festivals held throughout the year, but this one draws a considerable crowd. In 2013, they had upwards of 70,000 people show up at the Burning Man Festival. Now, this, of course, is 2017, four years later. Who, who knows? There may be over 100,000 people because it continues to grow. Now, it's not a festival like you think. They're not out there, you know, just enjoying themselves and, and, uh, and, and, and having uh, playful games and what have you. No, this is an occult ritual. This is a combining, a, synth a, 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 a synthesis of occultism of every stripe from practically every place on earth. And they come together, and of course they have their agenda. They always, uh, they've got a website, and they, they tell you what it's about, and, and you know, but... All of these words that they give out are coded words because they understand what they're saying. They, re they use a certain word. The person who reads that and understands what's going on at the Burning Man, they know what that means. It's called uh, semantics. Semantics simply means uh, I say God, you say God. When I say God, I'm not talking about your God, and you're not talking about my God. When I talk to an occultist about God or a New Ager or witch or Satanist or whatever, and they say God, they're not talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am. There's only one true and living God, folks. Just one. Just one. One true and living God. Bumper sticker said, I am God. Let me tell you something. If you're God, you don't have to tell anybody. Amen. Believe me. When that eternal being shows up, he won't have to show up and announce, God is here. Oh, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. The Old Testament Hebrew had it right because he, he the way he saw it, that if he saw God, he was going to die. And the Bible in the Old Testament is very clear about it. When they approached God at the top of the mountain, or they approached Him in His glory, or in other ways, they feared and they trembled. And the reason they did is because they came into the presence of holiness. Aren't you glad tonight that you can be brought into the very presence of God through our Lord Jesus Christ? Amen. And without Him you have no access to the Father, but with Him you have total access to the Father? Amen. That's quite a thing. Just think about this for a moment. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5 says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. God hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now I'm going to give you something tonight. Take home and think about it for a while. Don't come up with the answer too quickly because it's going to be a profound thing. I've been thinking about this all week long. How many of you remember Sunday? When was it? I forget if it was Sunday night or morning or whenever it was. That I brought, I mentioned to you about the essence of sin. How many of you remember me mentioning that? Okay, and I had one man come to me after the service Sunday morning and he, he had it figured out what the essence of sin was. That's fine. Good for him. And uh, he may be right. But I'm not satisfied yet that I know what the essence of sin is. But I do know this. I do know when the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world 2,000 years ago, He was the essence of God. Amen. Yes, He was. Hebrews chapter number 1 makes it very clear. The Lord Jesus Christ was God Almighty that came forth from the light that no man can see, that no man hath seen. That light wrapped itself around a virgin's womb, impregnated her, and he was born nine months later. Did you know that they have just discovered recently that when an egg is fertilized by a sperm, that a flash of light takes place? I wonder how Darwin figured that out. I wonder why Mother Nature has a flash of light. He's following me? When Christ came into this world 2,000 years ago, he was the essence of God in flesh. 
When he went to the cross at Calvary, he became the essence of sin so that you could be born again. From the essence of God to the essence of sin. If you can't see the love of God in that, you'll never see the love of God. Think of how far he has gone to bring man back to himself. The word that is used over there, I think it's katalaso, that, has ref that refers to the reconciliation, has reconciled us to himself. That word literally means that God made a friend out of an enemy. We were God's enemies until the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross and God made us friends. God did. On his side, he has stepped forward and handed that leaf to us of peace, the olive branch. He has given it to us and says, I am satisfied with the death of my son who went to the cross at Calvary. And nothing more, folks, don't ever let anybody tell you that something has to be added to what Christ did at the cross. That is pure blasphemy. I don't care how well-meaning they are, how good they think they are, how dedicated and consecrated their religion, Christ needs nothing. He finished the work at the cross. Bless his righteous name. So a Christian is one tonight who embraces Christ. A Christian is one tonight who has given his soul to the Lord Jesus. A Christian is one tonight who says, I have no righteousness. My righteousness is the Son of God, Satan. You can come and beat up on me all you want to and accuse me till I'm blue in the face. But the bottom line is, devil, it's not about my righteousness. It's about the righteousness of the Son of God. And that is my righteousness. Amen. That is faith, trusting someone else's work for you. We call it uh, substitutionary faith where he died in our stead. Yes. That's right. We call that, and he did. And so a Christian is one who has, does not have his own righteousness. A Christian is one who cannot save himself. A Christian is one who believes in one who did it all for him and has accepted him and received him into his heart and into his soul. Yes. I get a lot of emails, a lot of them, and I try my best to read them all. And it's, it's quite a chore, but it's all right. That's what I'm here for. I'm a minister. And I read these emails. And sometimes I won't even get more than two or three lines into the email. I start praying. For I can sense the need, the real need, the heart that's being poured out in that email. So I start praying right on the spot and pray for that individual. And some cases you get is just absolutely heartbreaking of the things that people are enduring and the kind, of, the kind of things they have to go through in this world. But I'm going to read you the testimony of a real Christian, a real one. Then we're going to talk about something that has to do with religion in just a moment. But I want you to hear the testimony of a real Christian. And I want you to pray about it while I'm reading it and think. This brother, and I'm not going to say who he is, he'll, re, he'll, can, he'll re, retain his anonymity, but here it is. Nowhere have I better heard described the born again experience and by a preacher than by you. Two years ago at age 28, I got saved. Two years ago. I was completely broken, jobless, barely scraping by. I protested reality because I saw the evil in it. No philosophy fulfilled me. And further down, I went into darkness. I cried out to the Lord, asked him to point me to the truth. I no longer had any expectation or desire to mold what God was. My life has been full of vain prayers. I cried out to the Lord, hoping that something would happen. Shortly thereafter, I felt compelled to accept Christ as my Savior. Notice the process that brought him to the Lord Jesus. For days on end thereafter, I repented. How many times have I told you that? For days on end, I repented. All that, listen, let me stop right here for a moment. That shows that this young man had real Bible faith because repentance is associated with it. Don't ever let anybody tell you that, a, that repentance is not associated with salvation. That's garbage. When a person truly believes and accepts Christ and the Holy Spirit comes into his soul, he is going to see himself like he's never seen himself before. And repentance is going to flow like a river. Amen. And so he said, Shortly, he said, in to, for, for days on end, after I repented, all my drug habits and perversions fell off me. I can't describe the joy I felt. People could see it everywhere. People often would ask what was different about me. I would explain it was Christ. Although many would scoff, others were genuinely interested to hear my experience. 
I was on fire because of the Lord. I bought a Bible for a curious girl. I would explain my testimony to everyone. <clears throat> I read the entire Bible in less than a year, and the Lord led me to a KJV, Baptist preaching, non-reformed church. <laughs> I fully under That's quick. It didn't take him long, did it? I fully understood what it meant to be a light on a hill. Eight months into being born again, eight months now, I let my pride come in the way. I had never experienced more female attention in my entire life, and I wanted to make that attention about me. I was foolish and let my guard down. I loved being idolized by women. I can't begin to tell you how many times the Lord warned me, more than a thousand times, and I'm not exaggerating. That's the long suffering of the Lord. I made the gospel about me. I boasted about it rather than allowing God to give me the love for others to share it. Down the slippery slope I went, Pastor. I started to watching garbage on television. I started kissing girls, texting several of them. Then I started hitting the bottle again. I slept with women. I worked with more than once. I started doing things the Lord took me from. Down I went, more drinking and then watching disgusting garbage on the Internet. I was being spiritually attacked and was getting involved in evil things that wasn't even a part of my life before I got saved. How many times have I told you that after you're born again, sometimes you'll hit a lower low than you did before? You know why? Because you've truly entered into a spiritual world when you're born again. You have been introduced to a spiritual reality that you knew nothing about before you were saved. The unsaved man, for the most part, lives for the flesh. That's as far as he goes. That's all he knows. He's the natural man. He, he, he feeds his flesh day in, day out. That's all he thinks about. Once you're born again, the Holy Ghost is in you, and you have a spiritual awareness that you never knew about before. He said, there's a heaviness to that spiritual plane that's on this earth. It weighs on you. It blinds you. In spite of it all, and I can't believe it, he said, is that God has always been here. Even if he's farther away than ever before, I know he's there. I can't tell you how this misery has haunted my life, and I beg the Lord to give me the joy I lost. I keep getting affirm affirmations to be patient, and patience is what I'm fasting for. He's fasting now. Pastor Lawson, I was arrogant and thought that I had put all these things behind me, but you were right. Sin can grab a hold of you and pull you down like no other. In a flash, you can have unexplainable joy in your salvation, but how quickly you can fall. I now understand how imperative it is to stay vigilant. Please pray for me, preacher. I want that joy back. And I did. I stopped right here and I started praying for him. I want to help others. I want that fulfillment. Nothing in this world is a worthy pursuit unless it's being blessed to do his will. The Lord God bless this young man right here. Father, restore him. He's going through a battle now. He'll never forget this battle. He'll never forget it. He'll never forget how hard it was to get that joy back in his soul. God will restore you. And if he ever puts a spiritual Christian in your life, Galatians chapter number 6, a real spiritual Christian, he, will, he or she will help restore you in the service of God. But the joy is always... So my experience has been the last thing to come back is the joy of your salvation. It's the first thing you lose when you turn away from God and the last thing you get back. But once you get it back, you're going to start jumping up and down and turning cartwheels. And those of you who know the joy of the Lord, you'll never be fooled again. <laughs> Once you know what it is to have glory come in waves down on your soul and you feel the presence of God in a powerful way that you can't explain, you know it's God, you'll never be fooled again. And would you all pray with me now for him? Just lift him up and say, Lord, restore that young man's joy now and God put him back where he wants to be in service to thee because he can help other people. That's a good testimony, folks. For somebody who's saved any longer than he has, that's a good testimony. There's a lot of people out there that will hear something like that and they'll say, Boy, there's hope for me. There's hope for me. And there is. Thank God for that. There's hope for me. Now, the Burning Man Festival, as I told you before, it's all about occultism. 
It's all about the occult world. They can call it whatever they please. They can style it however they want to. It's not going to change anything. It's about the occult world. Here's one observation of the burning man. He can be viewed as some sort of an occult mass ritual if we look at the symbolism involved. The man represents universal life. The wicker man, sacrifice. The torch, illumination, spirituality. The occult world, folks, the further you get away from God into darkness, the more they talk about you having light. Now think about that. The further you get away from God, bottom line, the darker it gets. But the further you get away from God, when it comes to these people, the more they ensure you, you're getting more light. You see how it goes? That's what you get into with this stuff. But anyway, the fire, bridge between mortals and gods. Sand, constant change, limitless aspects of personality. Desert, the unconscious. Black Rock, and this place is in Black Rock, Nevada. Black Rock, uh, Philosopher's Stone, awakening of the divinity within matter. You know what that's called, don't you? That's pantheism. Black, the primordial void. Rock, the divine, the immortal. And on it goes. And, 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 and as I've told you before, they all have the same spirit. When you get away from the Lord, folks, there's only one spirit out there. They can claim, they can, they, listen, they can, they, they can call themselves whatever they want to. They want to call themselves a Hindu. They want to call themselves a New Age. They want to call themselves a witch, Satan. It doesn't make any difference. They're all plugged into the same spirit. Same spirit. Uh, here's the truth. There's only one way to heaven. But there are many ways to hell. <laughs> That's right. There's just one road to glory. That's through the Lord Jesus Christ. But many, many paths and ways unto hell and damnation. So, listen to this testimony. I'll just take parts of it. This man says, Many days I was performing wedding ceremonies as an ordained minister in the state of Nevada. I asked a man, came in here one time, I said, Sir, he came down to the front, he wanted to join the church. I said, I said, are you saved? He said, I'm a preacher. I said, and I ask you if you're a preacher. I ask you if you're saved. If it offends you for someone to ask you if you're saved, we got a big problem that's a big red flag. Big red flag. Huge, huge, huge. I was performing a wedding ceremony as ordained minister of the state of Nevada, frequently, frequently took up my afternoons, followed by more wandering, talking with people about everything from politics to art to God. All right, he lays down that as a qualifier. To what God do you worship at Burning Man? Here's his question. It is not at all a religious event, he says. Oh, it's not. But you can find religious elements for all over the world. You can find conversations about God, Allah, Buddha, etc. And to me, he said, I find it interesting. Now watch carefully how similar the core messages really are. Now watch that. That's another big red flag. Anytime somebody tries to find a common denominator among all religions, you're dealing with somebody who has denied the person of Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is the common denominator with Christians. But he is not part of this occult world. But on he goes, he says, Allah, Buddha, so forth. He said, I find it interesting how similar the core messages really are. It only man's interpretations and need to be right that we tend to fight over. In plainer words, he said there's a universal truth, universal truth. And he said if we could only plug into that universal truth and that universal mind. Are you following me now? That's Mother Nature. If we could just plug into that universal truth and that universal mind, it would eliminate all of our differences. Now, folks, there's only one absolute truth. That's Christ, God's Son, salvation. Now listen to this. He sneers. A sign of hell on earth? Probably not. If anything, it's, and he's talking about, of course, what goes on at, at uh, Burning Man. It's laid out like an occult symbol. Probably not. If anything, it is the closest thing to heaven I have found. Now listen to this testimony. This is so sad. 
And this is coming from a formerly very indoctrinated Christian on the healing circuit as a kid. Now, let me put all that together for you. He says, at one time, I was a very indoctrinated Christian. Notice the terminology. The whole email, not one word, not one single word about the Lord Jesus Christ. Not a word. Not a word. Folks, without Christ, Christian means nothing. Zip. It means nothing. Nothing. So he's saying that I was at one time a very indoctrinated Christian. So what's that mean, preacher? That means in his, in his phraseology, it means at one time I was a fundamentalist, you know, believed all the fundamentals, and I was a practicing Christians and blah, blah, and this and that and so forth and so on. But the truth of the matter is there is no repentance. There was no real change of life. This man can go to burning man out there in Nevada, which is one of the filthiest hell holes on earth. They've got a temple out there. You need to see a photograph of it. I think I've got it in here. The temple. And you need to see it. Because all of these occult signs are as real as they can be. You're welcome to come up here after the service. Here in a few, here it is. And look at this stuff. Here is a temple. And it looks very simple, similar to a, uh, to a church steeple, right? But you're so far away you can't see it. You need to come up here and see the eye of Horus. You need to see what's going on in this temple. This is a piece of ecumenical garbage. This is occultism. It takes the cross and it takes the cross and perverts the true meaning of the cross and makes it part of the grand scheme of revelation to all mankind, whatever religion your faith tradition happens to be, Al Gore. It takes all of that and it puts it all together and it's no longer a matter of I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's what Christ said, right? That's what he said in John 16. I am the way. I am the truth. Right? No man cometh unto the Father but by me. No man. No man. But compare his quote-unquote Christian testimony with the testimony of a real Christian who is battling. And notice that that real Christian is not making excuses for himself. That he's giving glory to God. He is. Because see he's saying. He's saying you're right preacher. He's saying I made my choice. To go back into the world. And now I'm reaping the harvest. Of what I did. He said but even though I have done this. On my own free will. He has never forsaken me. That's glorifying God. He's been with me. All the way through it. And he's saying I know that. And he's saying, I want my joy back, preacher. I want my joy back. Now, what does that say? What did David say in Psalm 51? Lord, restoring to me what? The joy of thy salvation. The scripture says the joy of the Lord is our what? Exactly. It's our strength. Joy is something that lifts you above circumstances. It does. You're no, it lifts you above it. And the joy of the Lord is the strength that you get to overcome this world and overcome the trials and temptations and sorrows of this world for the joy of the Lord will carry you over it and through it for the glory of God. Amen. Now, you know, sometimes a Christian is stunted in their growth. I've seen that. They'll be saved and, and haven't been saved long. They're young babes in Christ. Listen, folks, there's nothing wrong with being a babe in Christ. Fact of the matter is a babe in Christ in some ways has, has it on us that have been saved for a while because everything's new to them. You know, it's all new to them. I mean, well, they're going around, good night, man. Didn't know this existed. Then all of a sudden something happens and they, and they sense God and it's just everything wakes up inside of them for the first time in their life. But if they get with the wrong crowd, they can be stunted in their growth. That's exactly right. And let me tell you something. These wolves feed on young Christians. Yeah, they do. They feed on them. They feed on young Christians. They want to take that young Christian and mold their mind against Christ and against the finished work of Christ. 
and for what other uh, uh, nefarious uh, thing that they have in mind. So young Christians sometimes get sidetracked like that. And then it takes them a while, and they stumble around, and sometimes 10 or 20 years later, they'll find their way back into the church, and they'll come back under the preaching of the Word of God. And it's almost like being born again all over. Shackles fall off, and the glory of God floods their soul. And for the first time in their entire Christian life, they feel that glory unspeakable and full of joy. How many of you felt something when you got saved? Buddy, I did. Say, that's how I know I'm saved. Well, that's not how I know I'm saved. I know I'm saved because somebody moved into me that's a whole lot bigger than I am, and I believe that Bible, and I love spiritual things. I know I'm born again, but I had a feeling when it happened. I really did. But some folks are a little stoic. <laughs> uh, and uh, like Zeno, the stoic, if you go back in Greek history, you'll find that he was upper lip, tight lip, you know. Bottom line is they didn't show much emotion. And so maybe he didn't feel much when he got saved. He just kind of shut down his emotions. All right. That's not telling you that you're saved or unsaved. I'm not saying a man is not saved. You come down here and you pray and you read the Bible, you accept Christ, you believe, yes, sir, I do. All right, good. They get up and they walk over there and they sit down and you don't see a tear. You don't, you don't see anything. But their life changes. You ever seen anybody like that? There are people like that. And then I've seen people come down, they get saved, and they turn around, glory to God. I'm telling you, you know, it's hallelujah, praise the Lord. <laughs> All right. Is anything wrong with that? No, <laughs> not a thing. Some people are highly emotional, more than other people. But the joy of the Lord is something else entirely. And the joy of the Lord came down on me on that back porch a few years ago. And the joy of the Lord has come down on me since then. Has come down upon my soul and it was the same wave after wave after wave after wave of glory. Brother Ed Ballou used to sing that song, I want to die on the battlefield. How many ever heard that? Die on the battlefield with glory in my soul. I don't know where that came from, but I'd love to hear him sing it. It came out of the mountains around here probably somewhere, you know. Been around a long time. And uh, he talked about dying on the battlefield with glory in my soul. Folks, joy is, is uh, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. It's what Peter said. And Peter said that, that you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory in the face of the persecutions of Nero. That's who he's talking about. That was the contemporary of Peter when he was writing this. That's a wonderful thing. Ask for it. Seek it. Once that joy ever floods your soul, something's going something's gonna to give. You'll never, you'll never be the same again. I'm not saying you're more saved than somebody else, and I'm not saying God loves you more than somebody else. No, sir. No, sir. But I am saying that there's more to God than a, a book of systematic theology. <laughs> right. You can have your Christology, pneumatology, hamartiology, eschatology, theology, all the other ologies. You can have them all lined up, cross all your T's and dot all your I's and not have the joy of the Lord. Amen. Amen. So I pray the joy of the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, I'll tell you one thing to not look for. So what's that, preacher? I'm going to tell you right now. Don't look for it. You're wasting your time. So what's that? You ain't going to see me at the burning man. <laughs> <laughs> they got nothing out there for me. No, they don't. No, they don't. <laughs> nothing. They got nothing for me. Father, in Jesus' name, we bless the name that's above every name. The name that is above every name. You gave him a name that the name every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he's Lord to the glory of God the Father. And Father, tonight I confess and glorify and joy in the name of the Lord Jesus that my life and my soul and my future, my existence and my essence is all wrapped up in that blessed name. There is no other name like the name of Jesus. It's who we are about. That's who our life is about. That's our destiny. That's where we came from and where we're going is the name of Jesus. And Father, may that name go forth, Lord. May it go out to the hearts of the people 
in this house and those that are watching this thing right now and those that may watch it later. May that name go forth. May that name, that name above every name, may that name stir the hearts of everyone that hears it and turn a light on inside their soul and put a hunger in them for God, a hunger that only God can satisfy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.